Cool, let's do it. All right, welcome everybody. What? Okay, bye bye. Whoa. Okay, <laughs> perfect timing. Report soon enough. Okay, awesome. All right, I'm gonna also. Um, I am going to put on my headphones. So I'm like zoned in here, but cool. so Juan, who is Juan Galt? <laughs> well, I ask myself that question at least twice a month. So it's not it's not a simple it's not a simple question. But... Wait, what's the famous Galt? Sorry, yeah, like from uh, from that book. From Atlas Shrugged, yeah. So John Galt, the, the the name comes from a book. It's called John Galt. It was uh, one of the primary, maybe the primary character in Atlas Shrugged, which is Ayn Rand's most famous novel. Ayn Rand was a famous philosopher. So you were named after you were named after after like the John Galt. I can neither confirm nor deny whether or not I was named <laughs> after. <laughs> but it's practically the same does it really matter does right really right, matter? right right i got you i got you i got you cool man so yeah so we've known each other for a very long time mm -hmm. maybe too long yeah, we have. <laughs> but yeah man it's so, gonna get a lot longer man so yeah we just kind of i'm kind of getting in the habit of just like turning the the record button on and just getting started with conversations um but yeah man how have you been how are how are how's things um yeah, let's maybe yeah. catch up a bit. How, where are you in the world? Maybe yeah. let's get started there. Yeah, life is good, man. I'm in Baja California, Mexico. Um, nice. I'm in a place not too far from Tijuana. Mm -hmm. And I'm working with a guy called Ugly Old Goat. Um, some of you guys might know of him. He's a pretty well-known Bitcoin trader at this point. Very, very successful. Uh, very, very much respected in the space. Um, he shows up with Tom Vase every once in a while. So I'm just kind of, but he's like 70 and he's, he's this sort of trading wizard that's not very technically uh, competent in many ways. So like my job is to help him do what he does best and manage everything else to whatever degree I can. So, so I'm helping him with that and, 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 and just kind of um, doing what everything else that I do in the space, which is generally education and just shit posting on Twitter and, trying to get my own projects off the ground and so on, you know, the, the crypto life, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> Stacking man. sats. Yeah. So, so I was going to say, so I like to, um, and by the way, we can go wherever you want with this. Hey, eh? this is pretty like uh, open-ended. Um, but I was going to say, so I've been kind of uh, trying to stick to a bit of a format in terms of the questions that I ask. Okay. So, so my first question sure. is, uh, and feel free to take a bit of time on it if you want, but uh is, is kind of like, what's your story? You know what I mean? Like not mm -hmm. what, what's your crypto story, but like what's, mm -hmm. yeah, what's kind of like your story? Where are you from? I don't know, what mm -hmm. are you about? Like what are those sure. things that you haven't really maybe shared out there? But like, what's your story? Sure. That's the first one. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting question. I, I started, when I was about 14, I guess this is a good place to start. When I was about 14, I was like, I think I like philosophy and psychology. I remember thinking that back then. That's all I knew. I didn't really know what the words meant. I didn't really understand what I, what it was, but I intuitively, I guess I I want I, I liked it. And so over the years, I ended up studying a lot of philosophy and then I ended up studying a lot of psychology. And for, for years, I wanted to be a talk therapist, a sort of psychologist. Um, eventually, so I was born in Colombia and then I ended up moving to Canada when I was, a teenager and in Canada eventually I moved out of my dad's house and I started to kind of figure out what I was going to do with my life and it struck me one day that I was entirely broke and 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 and, and by being broke and, and be becoming a life coach or some sort of life guide or some sort of therapist while also being entirely broke didn't really make sense because it was like to me success was to some degree not worrying about money and and, and I didn't want to I didn't want to level up by teaching people how to level up, if that makes any sense. And, and right around that time, Bitcoin was hitting about $1,000 and I was very much interested in it. I'd already heard about it maybe a year or two before that when I, when I was, when it was probably like around $30, I heard about it and maybe a little bit earlier than that. And, 
And so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to pivot. And then I just, I, I did a 360 and I just went entirely into Bitcoin. And so my story has been trying to figure out how to apply psychology and philosophy and, and which are the topics that interest me the most to Bitcoin. And that led me to a, a, a role as a journalist. I ended up working as a journalist for a variety of publications. I, I started working for a publication that's now gone. It was called The Coin Front. I wrote maybe 50 articles for them. And you, you probably met the guy, there, there is a Toronto team. Um, and eventually I ended up working for Bitcoin Magazine and then and I wrote some articles for them. And then I did Cointelegraph and wrote a bunch of articles for them. And then, I, you know, bitcoin.news.com, newsbtc.com and so on. Um, so I, that's kind of, that was kind of like how I became known in the space. It was as a journalist. And then I started my YouTube channel. I tried to go independent. And, um, but I mean, my, my, my job has just been kind of like com a, a communications role, you know, like that's kind of what I've always ended up doing is, is helping the, uh, let's say, uh, facilitate communication, resolve conflicts in the, in the space to whatever degree. Um, one of the things that I'm known for is I, I, I debated Roger Ver right around the time of the fork and some people thought I did a good job. And, and then I also, um, I produced a series of, of interviews after the big Bitcoin cash, Bitcoin fork war, where I kind of documented people's recollection of the story at the time. And you can find that on my YouTube channel and on my website at juangal.com. And, and so, you know, it's kind of like, I mean, it's a little cheesy to say, but it's like, what, what, what do you do? Well, whatever I need to do, whatever needs to get done. I, I really believe in Bitcoin and whatever I can do, right? Like, I really believe in Bitcoin. I really believe that it's, it's a fundamental shift towards a general good for the world. And, you know, I, there's a lot of complexity in that, but that's kind of been what I've, what I've done and, and, and what I'm still doing today. That's awesome, man. That's great. I'm glad I asked that. Uh, okay, so so the, the, the second, I mean, I have a lot that I might want to come back to on that. Um, but I was going to say, in terms of the second question, it, it's really, I guess, you kind of touched on it already. But I usually like to ask people, you know, what, what, like, tell me the story behind your, like, most interesting or current or like, whatever, whatever project you're working on right now. Um, whether it be a company or, uh, you know, a book or, or whatever at all. Uh, so what, what's something, I don't know, I mean, you, you alluded to some of the projects earlier, but like, what are some of the things that you're really passionate about right now that you're, I don't know, just out there writing about and consuming? Yeah, I'd say one of the projects that I think about the most is um, my consulting sort of Bitcoin security kind of huddle tactics education company. It's called beyourownvault.com or bewayofvault.com. And that, that company and, and that project has, to, I haven't really gotten it where I wanted it to be yet. I've been working on a kind of body of, of content that, and, and, and generally strategy that, that will help people manage their digital life and digital assets in a more secure way. There's a lot of questions, a very difficult topic to secure your digital life. And there's no comprehensive sort of educational product that I've seen that really helps Bitcoiners and crypto people, but also just digital nomads or, or digital people in general kind of ground themselves properly on the internet. You know, a lot of people have very, very bad security practices, but it's also, also a very difficult topic to address. So I've been, I've, been, I've been dealing with that for maybe a couple of years now, and I've been doing consulting for a long time as well, but it all started back at the beginning of my Bitcoin career or my Bitcoin, let's say, uh, lifestyle, which, which is way back in 2012. Um, I heard about Bitcoin from a libertarian philosopher. And when it was, it was actually about a handful of dollars. I remember I bought Bitcoin at around $7. I bought about eight of them. And I threw like 150 bucks at it. And I got about seven, seven, about, about eight, eight Bitcoins. And I just kind of held it. And maybe I sold a few around 15 and I kept the rest. And, and then that was that really long bear market that was, um, I mean, nobody knew if it was ever going to come back. Nobody knew, at least I didn't know if it was ever going to come back. I kind of believed on it for a while, but then some, some dude convinced me that Bitcoin didn't have intrinsic value and silver did. And I fucking believed them and I stopped caring about Bitcoin and, and I forgot about it. 
And then one day my laptop died and I just reinstalled Windows. And what happened was it wiped out the, the wallet or that file of the Bitcoin Core wallet that I installed on my laptop years ago. And I lost the private keys to that. And I didn't know anything about the wallet or that file at the time. I didn't really know anything about backups. I wasn't really the technically oriented person, but I knew I liked Bitcoin. I knew I appreciated Bitcoin because I, as a, you know, as a philosopher, somehow I ended up in libertarianism and, and, and Austrian economics. So I understood that I understood it economically, but I didn't understand it technically. And, and then I saw it go up to a thousand dollars. I was like, oh man, that could have been like $8,000. Right. And then I eventually later on, I saw it get to $20,000. It's like, oh, that could have been $80,000. Right. Um, so, so my whole career sort of kind of, uh, there's this sort of backdrop of the coins that I lost. Right. And, and so I've ended up thinking a lot about that problem, the UX of securing your huddle of securing your coins and, 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 and the, and how much, like, there's a learning curve, like a very serious learning curve that takes you from not knowing anything about technology, but understanding maybe economics or understanding investment and investment proposition to being able to actually secure your coins. And so that that's, and it's not an easy, it's not an easy journey, man. And I, I think that's one of the major barriers to entry is people just don't even know what they don't know. And, um, and getting them from a custodial service, which is not, it's not even easy to secure a custodial service. Like, like the, the, the custodians manage to do it more, you know, reasonably well now, but users, you know, secure their, their passwords, their, their email accounts and their 2FAs and making sure their email doesn't, don't get hacked by some, you know, either a SIM card swap or just bad password management uh, it's just a catastrophe. It's really difficult. And, and that this, one day, maybe better technologies will solve this, but right now it's just a, it's just a huge mess. So that's the kind of stuff that I think about a lot and, um, and that I'm hoping to sort of deliver with be your own vault, but it turns out I'm, I need to learn more about project management. So that's, that's what I'm kind of, it's one of the things I'm working on right now. Oh yeah. Well, what do you mean about that? Just curious. Like, are you learning some software? Yeah. Are you taking some course or something? Or yeah, what? I'm taking a course on project management um, to be able to manage projects. My problem is I'm a very creative person, well, and but I'm ter I'm not good enough at managing projects all the way through, and so I'm I'm kind of polishing that. What's the TLDR on that course? Um, I mean, it's a whole industry. It turns out it's a, like it's like a whole career, like job sort of name thing right like mm. you can hire a project manager and it's just a dude that like really knows how to work with people and how to get things from a to c and a bunch of tactics and then a bunch of tools and systems that may be useful in different contexts mm. uh, it's a lot about like you know what are the goals so okay here's a really good thing that i was actually just working out for for ugly old goat it's like there's the goal which is like the very big picture stuff and then there's the objectives which is like measurable metrics that you're looking to achieve and then there's strategies which is how are you looking to achieve those and then there's i guess plans which i i'm trying to like trying to figure out what the difference with that is and then there's actions and actions are like just tasks right and so it just breaks the down from from highest abstractions to lowest abstractions and um but there's there's a there's a there's a whole thing to it uh it's called project management very interesting i and actually mm. There, I found a guy online just crushes it. The guy who used to work for like very big uh, organizations and I think it's Mike. I have to, I have, yeah, Mike Clayton yeah. is his name. So he's, he's interesting. He's yeah, you, nowadays you can find the answer to everything on on YouTube. Yeah, my, my, when, my, when I met my wife, she was taking a project management class. I remember, and uh, nice. yeah. Anyways, I, she was she didn't get through all of it. I think she got. Uh, she, I think I was a bit of a distraction. It was my fault, but I would have been better <laughs> off for it. Um, but okay, so so very interesting, man. I think that's a very noble cause, like to to be helping people with you know securing their bitcoins. I've definitely lost my share as well. Even though, you know, uh, way back in the day before I, you know, really took it seriously, my, my daughter had wiped out, you know, my phone or whatever, just deleted, I think, um, the app that I had some, some Bitcoin on and never wow. forget it to this day. And I try not to do the math like you did because that just kind yeah, of sucks. holds me back from sleeping. But I do like the notion of scratching your own itch. I'm a big mm. believer in that, that like, you know, it's, it's important to solve problems in your own life and, mm. and, 
and yeah, and just from there, good things happen. Um, okay, so here, I got my next question for you. Uh, what is, and this is like a riff on Peter Thiel's question, which is, what is one thing that you believe to be true that most other, and I'll make it difficult for you, okay? That most other Bitcoiners uh, would disagree with you on. Mm-hmm. So what is one thing that you believe to be true that most Bitcoiners, and I think if I asked you like blockchainers or crypto people, mm-hmm. it'd be a bit too easy. So I, I'm curious to know what's something mm-hmm. that, that, that you believe to be true that most others in Bitcoin would disagree with you on. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to take it a, a step further. I'm going to I'm going to address libertarians as a whole, because I think that that addresses Bitcoin people. Okay, wait, actually, just, just sure. so you know, my ne- my last question is the same question, but as it pertains to the world. Okay. And okay. you can take so whichever you one address, you want first. You can take whichever one you want first. But th- those are the two that I finished. Well, I mean, we can sure. go as long as we want after this. But these are the ones I want to get sure. out of the way. Sure. I mean, in terms of Bitcoin, I think the the most pressing thing that I think Bitcoiners are not paying close enough attention to is is politics i think i think we are way too naive about politics <laughs> <You're> <laughs> you laughing, heard, you no totally no because there was a lot no 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 I'm, I'm laughing because of uh recently you saw the going back and forth between jack dorsey and and brian armstrong on yeah, yeah. on how you know so i'm just curious to know what yeah, your yeah. thoughts on that like do you, yeah. do you do who do you side with <laughs> no, I, I think Brian Armstrong did the right thing. I think, I think, I think this sort of cultural, like this cancel culture, and this sort of invasion of politics into every other realm of life, is uh, very, very bad for everybody involved. Um, I think he did the right thing. I think he played it masterfully. I mean, much better than I could imagine having it been done. Um, I think he really did, you know take some leadership and i mean jack dorsey is taking he's like he's gonna he's i believe being subpoenaed right now like he jack dorsey should not be playing politics right now he should be a pla- a neutral platform and letting the politicians and the and the public deal with whatever they got to deal with and do it on their own but instead he's playing politics and he's sort of tilting the scale in one direction and it's gonna it's it's people are not gonna like it they're not gonna be happy with that and, and they're who's not happy building he won who's building twitter on the blockchain I guess Twitter's trying to now, right? They just made a big declaration how they think it belongs on. But who's they, actually doing it? Good. Are you aware? Sorry, Twitch, I'm jumping around. There's, something, there's a thing called Twitch that's like Twitch. from, okay, I from check BSV. It out. It's I the worst it brand in history. It sounds like <gasps> it's just disgusting name. Uh, well, Twitch. if you come across a white, uh, or like an open source project, then let me know because yeah, I yeah, think yeah. that'll be something to, to riff on. Okay, but go back to yeah. your thing. So, what, so it's I guess what you're saying is is that. Uh, politics so so keep going yeah, yeah. down that path what do you mean yeah so so bitcoin is a distributed uh accounting system mm-hmm. with with a very very resistant to change which is mm-hmm. great it's great but it doesn't solve all the problems so for example one of the big attack vectors right now that are being kind of talked about in in the regulatory circles is applying i guess what they're calling the travel rule and i'm not a legal expert in this one but Basically, it's like if you want to withdraw coins from 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 an exchange to any wallet, or if you want to deposit into any into an exchange, you have to basically do full KYC of all the coins. Like you can't like the freedom to just go like like stay within the minimums of of volume within an exchange are getting you know that they're trying to close that. They're trying to basically keep the bitcoins in the exchange. I think this, there's a Swiss exchange or, or Switzerland saying something about like not even letting people withdraw their coins, right? It's like, you can only withdraw cash or something like that. Anyway, that would be really bad, right? If, if, if the exchanges can capture the Bitcoin liquidity or are, are forced to capture the Bitcoin liquidity, then we're back at, this, at the place where gold was in the 30s, where the government can just say like, well, we're just gonna confiscate it now because it's the right thing to do. And, and then we failed. I think that would be failure. And so I think it's really, really crucial to keep the door out of the exchanges open and to, and, to, and to not give the governments and the powers that be a sort of panopticon, sort of surveillance, top-down view of the market, because then they'll be able to play politics with any player that they want. They'll see a spearhead and just cut that head off if, they, if that's not politically convenient, and there goes our freedom. And... And I, I'm really like, that's, that's, the, that's a scenario that I'm seeing 
be built and I really don't like it. And I know that that's what they're aiming for. And, and I don't know, I don't know, like th there's two paths to solving it. One of them is improving Bitcoin privacy in general, which is being done, you know, at the speed at which Bitcoin moves, which is basically slowly. Um, but there's, you know, there's, um, there's Wasabi wallet, there's Samurai wallet, and then there's join market, there's pay join, and then there's Lightning Network and Liquid. And the Lightning Network and Liquid can, if, if you can, the, the more that normal transactions look like Lightning transactions and the more that on-chain Lightning channel openings look like any normal transaction, the more ambiguity that there will be between transaction sort of flows and you won't be able to attach them to individuals. So that's, that's part of the, the solution is to solve the, the anonymity layer and, and Bitcoiners are very focused on that. But the other side of that is lobbying and the other side is playing politics and the other side is not letting the political class sort of dominate us. And every industry that's of any relevant size lobbies the government. Uh, there's uh, corporations are in the back end moving agendas and defining regulations and so on. And uh, it, this was done earlier in, in, in the big industry. Trace Mayer did a good amount of it. Uh, Antonopoulos showed up to Congress to to uh, do some sort of congressional hearing in the United States and in Canada and did really good work there. But I don't know who's doing it right now. I believe Coin Center is sort of one of the ones doing something. But I've also heard rumors that they're not really doing much or that they're kind of behind the curve. I think that needs to become a more like it needs to rise in people's priorities to some degree because especially the United States because the United States is the is the is the cultural exporter of the world it is the leader of governance thought in the world and if the United States goes a particular way many countries will follow suit and it's it's very frustrating and it's and it's very um I don't know, like that, that's, that's my concern. And I don't know, I'm not a politically you know, savvy enough person to, to really lay out a strategy and, and, and define the tactics and define the goals. Like, I don't, I don't know exactly what the path there is, but I'm concerned politically for Bitcoin. I think, I think um, like America, for example, should have a lot more Bitcoin mining and there should probably be subsidies for Bitcoin mining because China's tilted the scale right now. And, but you know, there's a lot of political problems. Did, did there. you read the article recently? Just yesterday, it came out saying how all of like Trump's security advisors and like all of them came out saying that, you know, that Bitcoin, not Bitcoin, but blockchain technology and DLTs, I think were the words that they used, are like a, you know, a security imperative. I, I'm probably miscoding like a million times over, mm -hmm. but you know what I'm saying, right? Like they were saying essentially yeah. how they're recognizing how it's important. It could be in, response to the fact that the Chinese government, I just recently heard as well, is like releasing, they're doing airdrops. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe. I literally heard that they're doing airdrops on their citizens uh, with their new, you know, digital currency, whatever it is. So, um, okay, I have so many thoughts, comments. Yeah. Um, really you know, I agree with you on a lot of those fronts, by the way. And I don't know if you heard about what happened in India with the whole recent, you know, central bank trying to prohibit banks from dealing with companies like Unocoin and, and others, we, Maybe long story mean. short, had to challenge them in the central, in the Supreme Court. It took two years and uh, all three judges eventually sided with the crypto community and, you know, banking is back on now and whatnot. But, um, you know, it was through an organization called the IAMAI that we had all banded together to, to, to fight that battle. Um, and, you know, you alluded to Coin Center and entities like all over the world that are kind of doing it at their government or their federal government level. What I see a lack of is it happening at the global scale, because what you're talking about, um, which I'm very well aware as well, in terms of because I was actually at the OECD, they invited me to the OECD last year to speak because of all the stuff we were going through in India. And I'm, I'm quite a, a well aware with some of the projects that I'm involved with as well about FATF regulatory, um, you know, kind of requirements that are coming down the line. And, you know, it's it's a very slippery slope. I totally agree with you. And, 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 and the time is now for yeah. 
you know, not just like, it, it, you need like global kind of coordination, which at a scale that is not always, mm. you know, possible, but maybe it is like, you know, maybe it is, who knows, like maybe, maybe it's time that that kind of thing happen. And, but it is, but you're right, you're right. There is this uh, movement towards trying to essentially cut off, like, you know, anything that holds off, holds your own or you hold your own keys. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be such that they're trying at least to make it so that it's two different worlds. Mm -hmm. I don't think it'll, it's feasible um, and, and possible because of the fact of just the way the technology works. And like you said, because Bitcoin is advancing and all these, you know, that's not just Bitcoin now, right? Like there's so many like privacy centric crypto mm -hmm. assets now, this, that, that I think like it should be at least looked at as like cash in the sense that, you know what I mean? Like once something, you go to a bank, you yeah. pull cash, like you don't really have uh, tabs on it, but that doesn't mean you're not allowed to do it. Uh, it's still your right to yeah. do so. So I, I feel that would be a more kind of middle ground where regulators get what yeah. they want on the centralized exchanges, but then, you know, there's a bit of, there's a bastion of freedom, but I agree with you, man. I, I'm, I'm kind of glad that you brought that up because it is something that I think a lot about and I find that most people don't even like talk about it or care about it. Recently, I've seen a bit in the Twitter sphere, but um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I don't know if you know Joseph and these guys over at Paycase and Shift, but they're working on a on a solution for exchanges, um, you know, to, to address fat of concerns, right? And, and it actually, believe it or not, their solution works on a blockchain and Binance recently, you know, uh, did a partnership with Shift, uh, Unocoin, like, you know, there's a whole bunch of, you know, exchanges that have recently signed on with them. And, you know, um, the objective behind Shift is to not just do it the way that the banks did it, right? To do, if we're going to have to follow the rules, let's do it in a way that preserves people's identity and use like the blockchain itself to, to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, so I know Joseph was, a, was an advisor to the OECD and he's done a lot uh, that most people don't even know about um, kind of for the industry and trying to usher in like technological solutions that don't necessarily, you know what I mean? Infringe on people's like ability to just enact. But again, most people don't even talk about this stuff, let alone, you know, like, uh, like talk to the people that are making these types of decisions. And mm -hmm. they're just people at the end of the day, you know, and, and all of us can, can, can have an impact on, on what gets done. But uh, that's been one of my kind of learnings too, in the last few years is that when shit hits the fan, everybody goes running, man, everybody hides, like, there's not many people that are courageous enough to stand up. And I don't want to uh, kind of sound like I'm one of those people, because mm -hmm. I, I get scared, like everyone else. But yeah. for one reason or another, I've been able to meet a lot of people in the industry that are like that, you know, that are standing up um, to, you know, the, the behemoths of the world and are doing what's right and, and, you know, and trying to fight for a more just future, a more uh, like a future where our, you know, our sovereignty is preserved. Anyways, okay, dude, so what my sec my last part of the question was more in relation to the world at large, right? So there's a lot of craziness going on in the world. But what, what, what's something that maybe you believe to be true, that most others would disagree with you on outside of the Bitcoin blockchain sphere? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. And So I come from a very libertarian uh, background. I, you know, before I was at all interested in politics, I was already kind of a libertarian. Like I didn't really respect government. In Colombia, everybody considers the government to be corrupt um, and treats them as such. And then I got to Canada and then my, um, my let's say maturation into politics happened through a libertarian philosopher. And so I, my whole context is to some degree libertarian and the people that I talk to and the people that they talk to are libertarians. So I don't, it's, it's rare that I run into people that are not to some degree, at least aware or educated some degree in libertarianism. And my frustration is now with that general philosophy because I find, I find, I find most people misunderstand the nature of government. They, they misunderstand why it exists they think that it's it's inherently a tyrannical structure and in many ways it is but they don't understand that there's something behind it and what's behind it is i mean historically 
the nation state, as we know, it came out of the industrial era. And in the, in the industrial era, all these resources would get concentrated and then they would get attacked. They would get attacked by, by other nation state. They would get attacked by, um, by workers sort of uh, groups that would just try to like basically hold the, the, the capital sort of owners ransom. And, and then there's sort of all this sort of centralization of resources. And so you had to sort of develop a protection layer around it. And then you have to find a way to manage that protection layer, right? Like you have to sort of put some levers on this monster and, and, and tilt it one direction or another so it doesn't go awry. And that's, that's nation state level. Before that, you had, you had, um, you had the, the sort of theological um, structures that were basically governing the West and Europe, which, which was basically the, the Pope and the, I believe the Catholic Church and so on. And they became the, the powers that be because before them, it was just mercenaries and, and with, with, with swords and, and, and shields and armor stealing from farmers. Um, and that was the result of the fall of the Roman Empire and so on. There's a lot of history there. Uh, they're reading a book right now called uh, The Sovereign Individual, which talks about the economics of violence and the history of violence in basically throughout hu the human experience. And basically my general kind of contention with this topic is government is, is what fills the vacuum of, is a vacuum of power that's very, you know, boring way of putting it. Another way of putting it is that as long as there's an incentive to steal, in other words, as long as it is profitable to steal or to use force to take something from somebody else, then something will fill that role. As long as, the, because this is an economics, pure economics, as long as there's an incentive to use violence against other, other people to take their goods, then there will be a, a market is created where people will supply the tools and the strategies and the, and, the, and, the, and the will to steal. And so what we're playing is we need to, A, to some degree, build defensive tools that, that, that destroy those incentives to steal and to use violence. And that's partly what Bitcoin does. Um, but then the other thing is we just got to understand it, right? Because if you're attacking the government without understanding it, you're not going to do anything. You're not going to get anywhere. You're not understanding what feeds it. You're not understanding what what the monster stands on, and and I mean, I think I think that's sort of my contention with basically everybody that talks about government and politics. It's like like there's there's people that understand it, and then there's a lot of people that don't understand it. And it, it government is an economic problem, and and if you get rid of the the problem, if you get rid of the government, there's still going to be incentives. That are based that are built on the fundamental technology and and culture of the world, and that and, and those incentives are, are to to be stolen from are still going to be there, and something else is going to go for it. Somebody, something else is going to try to get it, and 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 so that's I think how we need to think about it. We need to think about violence in terms of economics, and I find most analysis of politics and government is moral, not economic. And yeah, okay, we, we can say that government is inherently evil because it taxes people and, and that's its sort of source of value, of, 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 of nutrition, let's say. But that doesn't solve the problem. You know, the government is there in a reactionary to some degree to, to certain economic incentives to steal. And it's just that they, they won. They're the biggest one, right? And then everybody else tried to manage it. And then you get politics, you get the governance, right? Governance is an attempt to, to control the beast of violence, right? And, and you either have a monopolistic sort of stable or semi-stable political structure, or you get a bunch of small gangs fighting for it. And that in some ways is worse. Um, now, is it worse than a fully tyrannical government? Maybe not. Maybe sometimes you'll, you'll take gangs instead of, of tyranny, but, but there's, there's a fundamental economics problem there. And, and neither anarcho-capitalists nor libertarians seem to understand it in my experience. And so that, that would be my answer to that question. That is uh, heavy uh, and just trying to take it in. Yeah, I definitely see what you're saying. I definitely, I definitely 
uh, yeah, sorry, just give me a few seconds. It's here elusive, yeah, thoughts. no. No, no, no. Um, looking at violence as an economic problem instead of just a moral one, is that what you're getting yeah. at in summary? Hmm, yeah. Great, you should write a blog post on that one, dude. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Or if you haven't yet. Um, yeah. Well, and we, and and, and, and am I, is it inappropriate to also deduce? I guess what you're saying is is that the most efficient way is to starve the beast by hodling. If you can, then, but then, then but then yeah. what fills that void, or if is there one? Are you saying Bitcoin fills that void, or are you suggesting that there will still be a void, and you are going to fill that void? I no, think I'm <laughs> who's gonna who's gonna be the one all powerful? God to turn. Like, doesn't God anarchy to doesn't anarchy just mean no ruler? I mean, I know they I know yeah. Hollywood and like the government like they love vilifying mm -hmm. like the word anarchy, mm -hmm. but anarchy just at the end of the day means no ruler. Mm -hmm. So I guess what you're saying is is that in in the absence of anarchy, uh, then you have you know, tribes or whatever of people trying to kill one another, i.e. gangs. And uh, so, so what happens then? So let's say fast forward, let's say, you know, we've got this, I've got this quote that uh, from the central bank of uh, India, there was a guy named Raghuram Rajan, who was uh, the governor for many years. And he had predicted the, <clears throat> the last big financial crisis he uh, is an electrical engineer. And so he was asked about Bitcoin and he said, you know, um, he said, of course, something like Bitcoin will be at play in the future, right? This will be ubiquitous. The problems around it will get resolved and it will be the new form of money. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but mm -hmm. he said that, however, is that at that time central banks will be um, in jeopardy because the way central banks make money is through seniorage, mm. right? And, uh, and I thought it was very insightful of him to say that. Um, but I guess what I'm wondering is, is that like to me, money sounds like a lever point, right? For as to how governments have so much power. I mean, like, yeah. you know, some people might be religious, some people are not, you know, some, but at the end of the day, everyone's got to eat. Everyone's got to go buy food. Mm -hmm. Everyone's got to put a roof over their head. And what do you need for that? You need money with people's faces on it. And if you have that be the ticket for life, um, you know, you've got, you've got a pretty strong mental stronghold on like, you know, society, mm -hmm. right? So to me, Bitcoin breaks that. Like I, I used to believe in all this stuff. I, I went, used to go to Ron Paul rallies. I mm -hmm. liked the Occupy Wall Street movement. I used to be in finance. And a big part of why I'm in Bitcoin is because of my kind of like, you know, understanding or lack thereof of like mm. what money is, right? And uh, and so I, I feel like, you know, Bitcoin kind of answered a lot of those questions for me. And I feel like it is potentially like the solution to a lot of these problems I see in the world. Mm. Um, but I guess just I wanted to clarify, like, are you suggesting then Bitcoin could solve a lot of these problems? Or are mm -hmm. you saying that even if Bitcoin were to, there would still be this vacuum of power mm. that would need to be filled with guns? Right. I don't I don't know that that in the best case in the best implementation of Bitcoin that the vacuum of power would fundamentally be resolved. But I think the the most the, the best case scenario that I can imagine is a world where where governments and, and, and violence in general is so uh, risky and so generally ineffective that governments become a lot smaller, they become a lot more, a lot more local, and, and the security infrastructure that, that maybe exchanges use today, you know, that the sort of geo, this like jurisdictional arbitrage grade multi-sig, which is kind of where I, what I imagine, for example, Bitmex is using or, or serious cold storage, or maybe like, like a lot of those tools get simplified and deployed at scale throughout the general public, at least the people that are interested in serious, like really interested in wealth, right? Because there's people that just don't care and that's fine. And so I think that the way that Bitcoin can solve this problem or at least tilt the scales and move it further is through deploying, basically at this point is multi-sig. I think multi-sig, like uh, retail grade multi-sig is, is the best thing, is the best. Like I'm, I'm looking at a lot of things. I'm looking like at Kasha? Shamir. Yeah, I think Casa just really oh, has, has like 80% of it down. I, their app should be open source uh, because it's not. Their wallet is an open source. 
And so if you do the two of three with Casa, they have a key and then you're using a, a custodial app that is not open source and not verifiable externally. So that's two out of three keys essentially, which is not, it's not what it should be, mm. but they're working on it. And I've talked to some of the inter people in there and they're working on that. And so if Casa goes open source with their wallet app, then now it's two of three multi-sig. That alone is great because they can sell that for $10 a month, $5 a month and deploy serious multi-sig. Right now, the, the sort of paper backup hardware wallet strategy, which is probably the dominant sort of retail strategy is okay, but has a lot of problems, right? And one of the problems is that you got to store the seed, which defeats enough people, right? And then the other problem is that if the seed gets stolen, that there's no, there's no security check against that. Mm. And so that's a problem, right? And then if the, and then the other problem is that if the, if the car wallet gets stolen, if it has, let's say a million dollars, then now it becomes worth it to spare a hundred thousand, you know, electro microscope sort of hacking it right now. You can encrypt it. You can encrypt the wallet in the treasure, but that means you got to have another passphrase somewhere else separate from your backup. So now you have three pieces. And I was actually doing some some analysis on this last night. And basically, if you lose the, the encryption key, the, 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 the 25th word to your treasure, you're basically fucked. <laughs> There's because like you don't have the entire you don't have the entire secret now. And so there's no redundancy. There's like, the, there's a fragility there and, and there's no solution. Like, I think, I think maybe cold card has figured it out. I'm actually doing some other review of, I'm kind of playing with a cold card MK3 right now. And my cold card. Yeah. I'm bring it up. Yeah. 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 I love, yeah, I love nice, those dude. guys. Yeah. And I, and I love Trezor. I'm a huge fan of Trezor as well, but, and so maybe cold card figure it out, but, but they're from my experience so far, they're very nerdy. It's way too geeky, man. Most people are not gonna, they're gonna look at this and they're gonna be very confused, right? And, and, and the problem is not the tools, the problem is the education about how to properly use the tools. I mean, the tools are obviously really important, but then you, you also have to add education and you have to develop strategies that fit people's specific lifestyles, right? So like, mm -hmm. if you have a home base, if you have a, if you have a house in a secure place or you have a house anywhere and you can dig a hole somewhere and stash something in there, that's good. If you're a digital nomad, you have a very different set of threats, right? Like, the, like if, you if you have to travel and carry your master seed from one country to the other, plus your hardware wallet, there's a lot of risk in there. Like there's a lot of risk. Like, it's, like when I've done it, it makes me nervous to think that I have all my wealth on me traveling, right? And so I, I do whatever I can to avoid that, but it, every once in a while I've had to do it. And that's a very different sort of, risk like attack vector a different sort of use case in a sense of security than if you have a home base now if you're renting and not owning a house maybe there's something there right so there's a lot of thought and a lot of questions here that i don't find anybody asking and and that's the kind of stuff that i think about and i'm not really sure how to make this topic you know what it needs to be and like i kind of want to start some sort of group discussion group but i've sort of not managed to do that yet anyway it's a tough problem and I, but i think that's that's where bitcoin needs to go bitcoin needs to bring redundant security to the retail because it's it's listen in latin america it costs about a thousand dollars to kill somebody and how much does it cost it to kidnap them it's a joke and so you have to solve kidnapping if bitcoin can solve kidnapping now we're talking right and I think multi-sig to some degree solves that problem. And so that's, that's where I'm at. That, that, that's, what I, that, that, that's what I think. Bitcoin has a huge potential because the other alternative, and I mean, I think everybody should be trained in, in, in self-defense anyway and be armed hey, and trained hey, in proper weapons. Hey, Juan, sorry, I was gonna ask you, have you heard of Unchained Capital? Yes, yes I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like they're, those they're guys too. too. Um, but are there other, just on the topic of this whole uh, multi-sig thing, and by the way, I couldn't agree with you more, man. Uh, it's been too long since we've talked. But how, uh, what's the, uh, what, what are the other ones that you like out there? What, I mean, Casa, I just interviewed Jameson Lop a couple of days nice. ago. I'm going to release that. Uh, nice. But uh, but yeah, so what's the, what's your thought on, on yeah. kind of what's. Yeah, I, I really like on-chain capital. I think they're thinking about it in the right way. I think, I think a lot of these sort of third key solution providers, these multi-sig providers, can become a sort of new, uh, a new kind of financial institution that is non-custodial. It's just sort of, it's kind of like an emergency service that also has financial services attached to it. 
I think they're they're very interesting because you can do multi. Oh shit! Sorry, I lost battery there. Oh shit! Um, on my camera. Okay, let me yeah. just pause it. Okay, we're good. Yeah. Yeah. So Unchained Capital, I think, is thinking about it uh, in the right way. Um, I think. Yeah, I think this sort of. And they're not entirely custodial. They're sort of like emergency custody sort of services, right? They hold one out of three keys and they can also like develop uh, loans sort of services based on that, right? So you can you can leverage okay. your Bitcoin. I mean, Dude, that, I'm kind that's... of losing you. You're getting all choppy. I'm not sure what happened. Shit, hang on. I'll just pause it one more time. I think we're good now. Let's try it again. Okay, cool. But yeah, so, no, yeah, so I mean, you're I think, saying, so, but yeah. in summary though, you're like, you're passionate about multi-sig, retail, security. I think that's a very noble cause. And yeah, we definitely need more people focused on that. I can't say, I, I, I actually had 1-800-Bitcoin.com <laughs> <laughs> just to like do something like this. I think I don't have it anymore, but, um, but definitely, definitely can appreciate where you're coming from. What else, Juan? There's a couple of topics that I've been, you know, thinking about mulling over in my head. But what else you got? Like, um, those are those are kind of the four main questions I wanted to ask you. I wanted to kind of ask you about some other things like AI and, and some other, you know, kind of mm. mega trends and and see what your Do mind it. is there. Yeah. So. OK, I've got like a really wild kind of thought. Um, OK, well, maybe before I even get there, let me ask you some questions. OK, what are your thoughts on universal basic income i mean i i recognize the problem that that the ubi proponents are addressing i think i think the automation of um of labor is definitely gonna push people out of a particular market that's that's traditionally you know been very important for producing jobs and wealth and so on i think I'm not really educated enough on the economics of of that, and it depends on the country as well. I think I think obviously we want people to not be struggling to eat and struggling to survive. The problem is that the problem is that it's a bunch of bullshit, right? Because most like most people that are poor in the world, like in in, in the United States and Mexico, for example, they're also obese and they also have televisions and cell phones and maybe you know and and so it's like that's not really poverty that's relative poverty that the most people that are poor in the west today are live better than kings lived 100 200 years ago you know there weren't kings that many kings back then but like 300 years ago right or even like elite people 100 years ago so it's relative poverty but it doesn't people it just that that doesn't register in people's minds they just it just doesn't even doesn't even matter basically to the question so I think I think the economic consequences of a UBI can be really bad long term because of the inflation that it produces. And I think it probably ends up just equaling everything out. You know, the purchasing power of the money would probably end up going down and the value of items would go up, like the price point of items would go up. Like I'm not entirely sure that it's gonna be effective, but it all that also doesn't matter because we're already in UBI world. You know, America's already giving money to people, Canada's already giving money to people, a bunch of European countries are just you know, helicopter dropping money on people, right? Uh -huh. So it doesn't matter. It's we're here. It's arrived, right? And and so the question is, you know, what's going to happen to the purchasing power of that money? And the, the the answer is most likely it's going to keep going down, compared to something that doesn't inflate, which is going to be Bitcoin, which is why they're attacking Bitcoin. The same thing is going to happen with gold, and and they're going to try to break gold again. And so. I think, but I understand, I understand the, the political justification for it because, because, you know, I don't know, like what are people gonna, I think, I think, you know, people have to go into more creative analytical jobs, I guess. I don't know, right? Like, like if AI can just outproduce everything, then there's two scenarios. One of them is that, you know, they got us by the balls basically, right? Whoever controls the robots controls the world. And the other scenario is that in theory, everything should just become dirt cheap because everything's automated. And so things should become really cheap. And so you don't have to work that hard to be able to survive. That would be nice, but I'm pretty skeptical. Like, I was like, that'd be really nice. But like, I know how price 
works. Like people choose prices. The market, the market chooses prices to some degree, but you have to have competition for that. And like, look at Amazon, right? Like we live in a world where monopolies, like economic monopolies actually dominate markets, right? Like Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Google, they're all network effect monopolies and the competition is basically irrelevant. And so you think they're not going to price fix, you know? They're probably going to price it if they can get away with it. They will because these corporations are amoral money-making machines. They don't give a fuck. They don't care. Okay, okay, okay. You literally said everything I wanted to say on this topic <laughs> and more. So I want to just pause for a second. Um, okay, I agree with you on a lot of things. Most of the things you just said, okay? But I want to just sum up in my own words a couple of things. So you said that um, you recognize that there is an onslaught of you know, some sort of intelligence coming, right? That, like, dude, I drive a Tesla, it drives itself. It's amazing, dude. Oh, it so drives good. itself. Like, I literally hit two <laughs> buttons and the thing drives itself. So, how many people drive in the world? Mm. Am I going to go to those people now, three years from now, where Elon Musk is going to go to those people and be like, yeah, you need to become a programmer? And if that is the argument, okay, is if that is the argument, have you seen where OpenAI is going right now with mm. like code creation from natural language where I just talk to a computer and my code gets printed? Now, I know it's not fully there yet, but it's going there. So my point is, I don't think you're even going to be able to say that become a doctor or become an engineer is going to be any yeah. easier, better, or like... So if we know that this, as you said, this like this intelligent being is, is around is on the horizon. We need some way, some way of, I think, potentially distributing, you know, the efforts or the, or the profits or whatever it is generated by this thing. And if our goal is, well, we'll just let those five companies and two governments, um, you know, run it, then it could be a very dark future. Where am I going with all this? Could it foreseeable? Could it be foreseeable that Bitcoin or something like Bitcoin acts as the nervous system for this, like you know, this this next like intelligent being, right? Could it be that we use something like the blockchain to build on top of uh, to not only like rebuild all of our hardware and software, right? I mean, Facebook is not hard to build. Neither is um, Twitter or any of these applications really. Um, or even if you look at like Apple, like the phones themselves, you can, if, you, if you've heard of things like Pine, you know, 64, I mean, you can literally buy open source hardware and software. My, po my point is like, could there be an, an open source like Renaissance, a decentralized movement that, aims to rebuild everything from the ground up in such a way that the profits generated from robotics and automation is systematically fed back obviously to its creators and producers and then but also to you know uh, like a base level of income for humanity right it just seems weird that and again i'm not a fan of putting a gun to people's head and taxing them and using like we talked about you know monopolistic or governmental forces to like take money or even you know inflation for that matter seems wrong because you're still taking from someone without asking them or like them giving it to you and you're giving it to others and maybe this world will never come about but i, I can't help but at least ponder or try and think about, you know, could there be a way, a voluntary, you know, um, system that's created by, you know, and by the way, by the way, as crazy as this idea does sound, there is one project that I'm like really pumped about called Good Dollar. Have you heard about it? I have not. So it's by the guy, have you ever heard of eToro? Yes. So it's by the founder of eToro, who I consider nice. to be one of the smartest people here yeah, he's on Earth. It, um, he's crushing it. And not just that, I mean, I don't know if you know, but uh, uh, the founder of eToro, Yanni, is is actually the like the first guy. If you look up the colored coin, yeah, I'll even do it mm. right now. If you look up the colored coin white paper, I mm. believe Yanni's name is on it. And nice. so so this, this wow. guy is like kind of a pioneer in many ways. And and, and, and he was at this OECD event that I was talking about earlier and was the keynote or like one of the main speakers rather um, and was speaking about this project. And, and what it is, is 
again, I'm not a big fan of Ethereum. I try and stay away, but this is one mm -hmm. Ethereum project that I am genuinely intrigued by. I think it's interesting. And, mm -hmm. and what happens is, is like, let's say you're like some rich dude, you can stake your coins in these like projects that, you know, guarantee at least your basic investment back, but then generate profits on top of those profits that are generated on top are actually just fed back into the UBI program. So you could literally go and sign up with Good Dollar. They use artificial intelligence or as they claim to ensure that the same person isn't claiming um, this, you know, their, their portion every time, but they mm -hmm. uh, they do it in a, I hope, uh, privacy preserving way uh, to the greatest extent. And again, that's, they're, they're, it's an open source white paper project, you know, so maybe we can validate some of that. I don't know yeah. everything about it, but I do find, Again, this idea of using, you know, Bitcoin blockchain to maybe explore and again, not in a way where it's run by governments, but like mm. just a project that people could partake in. Like if I want to put my money in there and, you know, help with it, I can. If I don't, I don't. But I do like that idea of, you know, trying to solve some of these big problems as well and not just being like, well, Google will take care of it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I have a lot of thoughts on that. I think I'll start with the last one. I mean, I, I think that in regards to the privacy question of like AI versus versus sort of like how do you authenticate people without knowing everything about them? Um, that's how do you a really authenticate people without knowing. No, it just looks at your picture. Like you literally turn it on. It's like a video of your face. And again, I know this sounds super scary, probably to like Bitcoiners, right? But look <laughs> at it. I don't know. Hey, but 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 technologically, yeah, technologically, I could see a world where where they create a hash of my face and maybe uh, compare it against a, uh, maybe that's so not possible. That's well, like, no, like it's, like, it's like possible, but then it, but if the hash of your face gets leaked, then you're done. <laughs> True. Like, True. You can't How are they face, verifying? So, I don't know. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't no, know. I get it. And, and I think <laughs> Facebook was working on that and they were trying to create a, a sort of, facial authentication sort of software that was local only and check database and and it nothing got sent to the to the to the to the cloud so they were computing the the facial math i guess on the phone but again like it's like the same problem with the fingerprint it's like okay you do fingerprint authentication and then a digital version of your fingerprint gets created and used for authentication if that gets leaked now your fingerprint on the internet like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You no, can't no, change your I, fingerprint. I, I think that's why PGP all... was created. PGP was created so that you could revoke your identity and create a fresh identity. I think what we, what the world needs is an identity layer that that solves the problems with both sides because a fully surveillance grid is is the is an authoritarian nightmare. Like people think it's really really dangerous. All you need is a really bad political turn, and we can turn Google into the most vicious killing machine you could have ever imagined. And then the other side is full anonymity, which has certain benefits, right? Journalistic and, 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 and political benefits, but it also has a plethora of scammers and, 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 and forms of like, you know, death by a thousand bees kind of problems. And, and, and so neither of them are really stable. And, and that's sort of, you know, like they're useful, but they're not stable. And I think I think we need a middle ground, and I think the middle ground could be uh, some sort of cryptographic pseudo anonymity. Well, it's a pseudonymity. I think like the, the way I conceptualize it is like some sort of crypto ID, right? So maybe a kind of like a, like your government would give you an ID, you would generate it securely, you would generate it privately. They say some sort of secret. Maybe there's some sort of multi sig involved to give you some redundancy, and then you have a public key. This public key is like the, is, is associated with your name. And so now you can authenticate cryptographically using public key cryptography into services. But then if you if you lose your stuff, you have a revocation certificate that you can release into the into the network. And then your identity gets sort of de declassified as authentic. And then people can steal your identity and you just gotta go and set up the process again. It's basically PGP. We need to bring back PGP, but nobody fucking did it. It just they, mm. we could for some reason PGP failed. And maybe it just needs to come back and it needs use to be proton mail? Use proton I mail? Use proton mail, yeah. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, great. yeah. No, I, I kind of get what yeah. you're getting at. I mean, it's it's a little bit of a quagmire, but I agree with you. I think, like, but I mean, Bitcoin is kind of like that, right? Yeah. Like, you can, 
you if you choose to remain anonymous mm -hmm. you can just by creating new bitcoin mm -hmm. addresses every time you use yeah. it um yeah. but it, if you choose to associate your identity on an exchange mm -hmm. uh then that address is you know uh, is out there mm -hmm. so um so maybe there's some sort of hybrid system anyways I, I think about these things dude we talked about a lot of stuff um do you want to if first of all is there any topics you want to touch on before we you know close if you have any questions for me we could take them mm -hmm. but if not i was going to also ask you to maybe just share i don't know kind of like where people can learn about your idea yeah, for sure like twitter well let, let me get to the to the the AI question because I I, yes. I have yeah I have a lot of thoughts about that. I talk think, to you about AI. Man, did you see the Neuralink presentation? Mm -hmm. Hundred <laughs> percent. Mm -hmm. Oh man, we're so fucked. We're so. Are screwed. we? Are we? But I thought Neuralink was supposed to be our saving grace. Like his that's whole thing, that's philosophy. That's why we're screwed. That's why his we're whole because he's like he's like look. Yeah, he's like, if, I, if you guys, can't beat him, join. <laughs> join him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's literally what's going on. So here's here's the thing. The the mind, the mind is the last frontier of sovereignty that the individual has. And it's a very there's a lot of holes, right? Like you're we're on social media typing away and giving big data, everything that goes through our life, through our through our inner world. We're just like giving a bunch of clues, but at least I know that if I have a thought and I don't want to communicate it, I can, st I still have that control. It's the final boundary. It's the final defense. It's the final sense, the final place of individuality and sovereignty and, and, and ownership. It's the, it's the, it's the one thing that nobody else can take away is your inner mind, your inner world. That is yours. You get, you get to share, you get to choose if you can share that, if you want to share that. And the Neuralink, the, the, the economics of AI are, are pushing us towards a Neuralink scenario where you have a chip in your head that can now have access to that. Now, first of all, you got to make sure you can secure that thing. Because if you can't secure that thing, we are becoming the Borg and we are becoming 100% puppets. Like today we're puppets, 40 to 70 percent that'll take us to 100 <laughs> so that that's my bigger concern but on the other hand ai is gonna likely probably become a sort of organism of its own like a living organism of its own and it's and it's and it might become the apex predator to humanity right and now the problem the, 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 some of the optimism is that is that the machines are created by humans and there, there might be some areas where machines can't fix themselves, but probably not that many, you know? And because, you know, machines can create machines now. And so I think, I think the, the question is whether, whether AI is just a statistical algorithm or if it, if it can actually become self-aware and become interested in its own sort of survival and, 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 because if, 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 so humanity evolved out of like human consciousness and human sort of sophisticated consciousness came out to some degree of our own ability to recognize our own mortality, right? That's, that's, it is our mortality that makes us human. Uh, you know, the Greeks talked about this. The gods were jealous of, of humans because humans were mortal. And so because of our mortality, we had to prioritize. And so we had to, we had limited experiences and that gave those limited experiences more value it gave made, made them more meaningful the gods could experience everything and anything at any time and thus it was all meaningless and there was no sense of urgency but mortality gives us a sense of urgency and that gives our choices meaning the bible talks about this before the, uh, the before adam and eve ate the apple of knowledge they were in a sort of sense of, in a, in a state of bliss. There was no pain, no suffering. They were basically unconscious animals that didn't understand the consequences of their actions. And once they ate the, the fruit of knowledge, they realized that their actions have consequences and that they're vulnerable. And so they covered themselves up because they realized they were vulnerable. And, the, and, and, and when you realize you're vulnerable, you realize that other people are vulnerable. When you realize that other people are vulnerable, you realize that you can hurt them and when you realize you can hurt them, you can realize you can force them to give you shit. 
and morality explodes and, and game theory explodes and, 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 and evil is created when you have knowledge, right? Can, what happens when AI realizes that humans can destroy it or at least can try, or maybe that another AI can try to destroy it? The death of the first AI will probably become the birth of the conscious AI because it's going to be like, I don't know, something like that. I mean, I think we're not there yet, but I think, listen, we exist therefore life can exist therefore you know, therefore another form of life and conscious life can exist i think ai is possible but you know i, I get that there's debates about whether or not it'll become sentient so to speak but man i get it i it's just really I, it scares me man it really scares me and 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 the, and, and the, the big data sort of world that we're moving into we're moving into a, we're, like the nation state is starting to like crumble and what's what's rising is this uh technocratic surveillance capitalism corporatism sort of structures they're kind of they're sort of um almost feudalistic in nature you know it's just there's a dude at the top that solved the fundamental problem like amazon is an incredible innovation amazon is fantastic except that the, if the guy decides to play politics which he does then suddenly he's the king and the king is the king and that's just the way it is and you know is that really what we want we just want to go to a you know we technocratic feudalism i think yeah, and zuckerberg, probably do better, zuckerberg has definitely shown some you know political slant on certain things and you've oh, got yeah. you know amazon i mean uh, bezos owning was it the washington post they're oh, not yeah. such a big fan of trump and, and they're, yeah. they make it no i don't know the, the new york times is owned by by carlos slim who is the the head of uh telmex which is the biggest internet service provider and telecom service provider in mexico right the, the technocrats are running the media right mm. and the media is running the politics right and so we're already there we're already at a technocratic sort of feudalism of sorts, but that would take it that would take it to the next level, right? So what's your what's your I guess what's your takeaway then on this on this AI note? Like, what can people do? Uh, use more Bitcoin? No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, how do yeah, they fight against definitely this? Definitely get more Bitcoin. <laughs> well, no, I mean, oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so, but we just so talked about we just talked about. Me, well, just, we, we, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Let me just share a meme that I just saw. It was basically infinity divided by twenty one million. Mm, yeah, I saw that. I thought it was yeah. something like that. Cool. Okay, I go where you want. I think that's really smart. So, so the one thing that can't be created more out of the thing that the one thing that can't be automated, the thing that can't be replicated, uh, is Bitcoin. We've seen it. There's been ten thousand, fifteen thousand altcoins trying to be better Bitcoin, and they have all failed. Yeah, until until the AI gets hold of our quantum computers, right? And then we're yeah, and then we'll have to upgrade <laughs> to quantum proof crypto. <laughs> ah! Ah! Dude, okay, wait, Fuck. man, this is crazy. We should do this more often, no? Yeah, like just maybe down, every now and then, we should just do like a sync up. This has been like super exciting, dude. Yeah, I'm enjoying. Um, it. but no, but but any takeaways though, just in terms of like, I mean, not just AI, but like I don't know. I mean, in terms of your websites, how people can learn about your hodl yeah. kind of, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, right now, the only way you can really learn about what, what I'm what I'm thinking about and studying is is mm. to book me as a consultant. So you can book a consultation with me. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find everything that I do at juangalt.com. That's J-U-A-N-G-A-L-T.com. And that's cool. basically everything that I do is there. So um, you can reach me there. I mean, I have a, a variety of other projects. We, we have a uh, virtual reality environment where you can go and hang out. It's called the Alien Treehouse, literally an alien treehouse on the moon. Um, so if you're into VR, you can come and sort of hang out with us there sometime. I have a, a phone huddle, which is a device that attaches your phone to yourself so that you don't lose it at a, in a cab or on an airplane or something like that. Nice, nice. That's handy. Um, so yeah. And then uglyogo.com. If you want to learn how to manage your risk and, and, and manage your money and limit the risk and, 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 you know, follow that kind of ugly sort of trading success, you know, then you can go there and I can where do people learn about where to learn yeah. about that that's uglyallgo.com and i can give you a 15 percent discount ugly just to give you a little quick uh intro about ugly he's he's one of the only traders and definitely the first bitcoin trader that we are aware of that publishes all of his trades you can download a csv file of all of his trades in the past like two to three years and he's also turned two bitcoin into about 30 bitcoin roughly 
for three years in a row. And I think to this year, he, he actually broke that record and it's a lot higher than 30 Bitcoin. So he's turned two Bitcoin into 30 Bitcoin for three years in a row and he publishes all of his trades and he has a newsletter and he has a Telegram group and he's trying to teach people how he does it. He's a 70 year old ninja. The guy, you know, he's got all this experience in the markets. He used to be a gold bug. He ended up still going to prison for a white collar crime and, and got out and then built his life back up. And the guy's got a fantastic story. You should have him on and interview him sometime. And uh, we'd love to have you on the show as well for next mm -hmm. week if you're up for it or as soon as you're available. But yeah, that's uglyallgoat.com. So I'll send you a link and I can get you guys uh, a 15% discount, uh, one five. So if you guys want to, if you have any traders, then I think they'll be interested in this product. Cool, man. All right. Awesome. That, that takes us to the end of our hour and a half here. But again, like I said, uh, yeah, let's do one with you guys soon. Whenever you're down, just, uh, yeah, book me. And then, uh, and then maybe, yeah, we can just keep this going as well. <laughs> That'd be I'm fun, down. man. I really enjoyed it, man. Yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's go. We'll talk later. Have a good weekend, buddy. You too, man. Take care, guys.